Good morning, everybody. We are live. It is cliffcentral.com on a Monday morning. A normal five-day week this week, but don't forget next week uh, we've got that annoying public holiday in the middle of the week scenario. I think it's on a Tuesday. And for many people, that screws with their balance. So, you know, you might be one of those people who gets um, to take some time off. You get to, to take off Monday and then you have an extra long weekend, which is not a bad idea. I'm, I'm saying just, you know, if you can do it, do it. Get what you can. Mm. All right. We're here and live on a Monday and Leanne Moll's here and C.S. Sanguini's here and you're here and that's all that matters. So uh, up and at him. Let's go. Let's get cracking. Good morning, Ass. Good morning, Sia. How's it, guys? Good morning. Dare Hello. I comment? Dare I comment on Leanne's hand? Try to figure out what what that's called. <laughs> yes. What is it called? Because we had pigtails and ponytails, and we had a huge argument the other day. That is a bun, isn't it? Yes, it is a bun. Mm. <laughs> I was going to say a top knot. That's no, a bun. I think that's, I think that's what men wear. Oh, Isn't see. a bun the same as a top knot, though, except that one is worn by a man and the other by a woman? <laughs> oh, boy, here we go. See, it always becomes like an <laughs> argument, doesn't it? It's so weird. <laughs> what is wrong with us? Uh, I don't know. It's a top knot. I'll call it, it that. It is a top knot. No. No, well done. <laughs> All right. So um, what's been happening, everybody? What's been going on? How was your weekend? What a busy, busy news weekend. Yeah, there was a lot Jeez. going on. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, awesome, right? Uh, the yeah, the well, kind of weekend where you, you, you should really be sitting in front of the TV doing nothing just because you could watch a whole lot of stuff happening in real time. Amazing. Yeah, what, what I often try to do over the weekends when we on doing the show live is mm. not try to take in so much since we do that Monday to Friday. We yeah, have to keep up with what's what happening mean. with the news. But this weekend, right. I just couldn't avoid things. I was sitting in front of the news and, you know, discussing yeah. things and trying to get details of when this happened and why did this happen. It was so much going on. Well, I mean, on, on that note, maybe we should just start off with something that's an ongoing story. And I don't know if you mm. saw this over the weekend, but uh, UCT is pretty much burning down, which is awful. And, and I mean, there's some pictures that are coming through, which are just so disappointing and depressing. I mean, that's the upper campus at UCT and just very, very sad pictures of the whole place being destroyed. Um, you could see that's, uh, that's the restaurant that was at the Rhodes Memorial. And yes. uh, very, very sad. Uh, it's obviously, I don't think it's arson. It might have been that started the fire originally, um, but this is this is a, a natural fire, and you know that we've got all those fires around Cape Town. And um, you know, the worst part of this is that all the thoughts in Cape Town couldn't take their their selfies um, because the smoke was was a bad filter for them, and you can't show your ass so well in uh, in <laughs> selfies. But here's the UCT library, and the reason I'm showing you yeah. that, that picture is. I mean, that fire is, is really just destroying everything in that building. What's so scary about the UCT library burning down like that is that it's got um, in its archives <clears throat> some 100 and 200-year-old books and mm -hmm. collection documents. I mean, the uh, I think the first ever Glossa uh, Dictionary has, has probably gone up in flames as well. We've lost a lot of very precious things in that fire. And, um, I think it's just so devastating and sad to see this stuff. You know how much I, I hate it when I see, um, precious things and things that can't mm. be, that can't, you can't buy new versions of this. You know, you can't just go and replace them. You can't go to yeah. the, uh, the shops and buy a new one. It's, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a very sad state of affairs. And I really, I, it just breaks my heart to see this stuff. So if you've, if you're one of those people who went to UCT, then then you probably feel it more than any of us. Um, but apparently they had to evacuate people, they had to evacuate students, they had to evacuate houses in the area. And um, here's a video of this explosion at the restaurant at the Rhodes Memorial, which you can see. Oh. Just look at this. Unbelievable. You can see the, the restaurant burning there in the background. Oh. And then suddenly there's this fireball um, as the Rhodes Memorial restaurant catches fire. It's just a very, very ugly situation. And, Yikes. Um, yeah. And then there was a fire as if that isn't bad enough. There was also a fire at uh, Charlotte Macaque hospital over the weekend because, yeah, that's right. yeah I mean, there, there were, so I didn't know what was going on. And then on Saturday, um, I saw videos from a friend of mine who's in emergency services and he was like, we're evacuating the, the whole of, uh, Charlotte Macaque. And I was like, what the hell? 
How crazy. How's that? You know? Yeah. And so then... I, look at this quickly. i give you an idea. There might be some audio with this as well. But mm -hmm. you can see nurses and doctors like wheeling patients out and, you know, the, the, a whole sort of wing of the place caught fire. It was quite also quite devastating. So whoever's been playing with matches this weekend, please stop. It's really Jeez, not doing any work. I'm beyond annoyed to find out with the Charlotte Mutlicker Hospital situation that mm. partly the fact that it grew so much was because there was no working fire hydrants. This is according to okay. a, a report by Times well, Live. I heard so that what if it that happened, is true. Yeah, I mean, come on. apparently the, the fire engines pulled up and, you know, they need to connect to those fire hydrants, the, uh, the, mm. the, the, the water mains, basically, so that they can use that water to put out the fire because you need huge amounts of water. You can't just connect to a normal hose pipe, you know. You have to have those big um, fire hydrants, those, those ones that we see um, on the sides of, of streets in, in most cities. Well, apparently, because this is South Africa, thieves had stolen the fittings off of these fire hydrants. So you couldn't connect the pipes from the fire engine to the fire hydrants. This is, that is the kind of thing that I'm sorry, you know, when we talk about how South Africa is a great place to live and all the rest of it, it really is. It's all of those things, but it just drives me crazy that we live in a country where that kind of thing really makes us seem like a banana republic. That kind of thing is just because it's not policed at all and cable theft and you know infrastructure that's just stolen all the time and mm -hmm. uh, copper cables and all of that sort of thing and now this just proving that you know for people who are who are thieves and criminals and don't give me that whole thing of oh they you know they're poor and they need to make a living you cannot excuse theft just because people are hungry just because people are desperate there are things that they can do that are not illegal and it bothers me that when a moment of emergency arises like this, you suddenly come to terms with how badly we man manage our, our infrastructure, how, manage, how badly we manage society. And it, it drives me mad because, you know, more people could have lost their lives. We could have saved more of the building. We could have put the fire out in time. Instead, we're now dealing with massive, massive destruction and possibly loss of life. Yeah. Uh, Leanne, we can't okay. hear you. I've looked into it before. It was muted because of the the hardy dots. Um, okay. But so I can't remember the exact figures now. But I was looking at countries that ha have a higher unemployment rate than us and higher yeah. levels of poverty, yet lower levels of crime. And yes. that for me points to a people problem and not a poverty problem. Absolutely. Um, now, yeah. now how do you how do you even face it? How do you face that down? Because some people think that even to bring that up is to somehow acknowledge something that's uncomfortable or to or to say that there's something worse about South Africa than about anywhere else. Um, mm. and, and that may or may not be true. I'm actually not terribly interested in the answer to that. What I'm interested in is what we can do to fix it. And, yeah. you know, at this point, at this point, I'm just like, that kind of thing is just, it makes me crazy because, you know, you see tea burning. That's, there's stuff there that we can't replace. The, those buildings are historic. If you if you watched any of you know Prince Philip's funeral over the weekend, you'll see how history, tradition, and keeping up for hundreds and in the case of Windsor Castle, almost a thousand years of historic buildings and artifacts and traditions, it adds value to your society in ways that you can't just replace, in ways that you can't just you know put something back where it was. If it's gone, it's gone, and I'm very concerned that they they didn't digitize that library. I'm very concerned that in the hospital, they didn't have a plan for dealing with this. I mean, it just seems to me, you know, these, these are very, very sad stories and, and make me very, very uncomfortable. It's, just, it's the kind of thing that yeah. I, 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 lose, I lose a lot of hope. And I don't want to start this Monday morning making people feel bad, but I do think we've got to acknowledge these are very South African problems. I was moved, though, yesterday, and their intentions are let's assume are good and maybe there might just be some PR, but in this case, I also think they deservingly should get that PR. How a lot of corporates have banded together in and around Cape Town in the past few hours yes. just to assist people there. Um, yes. You know, like the ride hailing apps, if you used a certain promo code, they, you know, you would get 
free trips to be moved away from the fire. Um, yes. Some restaurants were offering students free meals, presumably those who are uh, staying at res and hadn't had dinner. So all you had to do is just show your student card and you'd get a free dinner. You know, things like right. that. I'm like, okay, this is good. You know, people helping yeah. out yeah. where they can and banding together. I thought that was really, really sweet. That is that is good, and I, I agree with you, Sia. Like the, you do see the best and the worst of humanity in a situation like that. Anyway, I mean, those are the big oh. those are the big South African stories. There's lots of other stuff we've got to talk about, um, and and we'll get into that. But uh, I also went to a wedding over the weekend, which ah, was really hello. nice. Yeah, and it was a it was such a happy thing to to be at because you'll remember that just before lockdown started, I went to a wedding the weekend just before the president locked the country down. And um, I feel like we should be coming out of level one sometime soon because it's really unnecessary for us to have any more restrictions on people. It's, it's, it's not doing a damn thing. I told you I went to a bar, a, a, you know, sort of a restaurant bar about two weeks ago, and it was jam-packed. I mean, if you're the kind of person who's nervous about COVID, you would have lost your mind. Um, everywhere I stood in that place felt like it was a passage. And this wedding over the weekend, I think there were about 100 people. And I didn't... I didn't worry about anything. I don't even think I had a mask with me um, at any time. And there were people who, who had masks on them, but we didn't wear them. And, you know, we, we all sat at tables like we would have before at a wedding and, um, and in, the, in the congregation during the ceremony, which was very special. Everybody seemed to be having a very good time. So it felt like normal. It felt like, um, you know, the pre-COVID times, which was awesome. So I loved that. And uh, I really think... Like we've got to get back to normal now. The numbers are dropping, like you can't believe. And and it's really it's we've made it through. We can we can start to feel good about that. We can congratulate ourselves. Um, we can obviously take stock of all the things that we didn't do right. And I do think we need now to um, to get our lives back together, get our lives back up and running, because um, getting back to the office and doing normal things is probably on everyone's agenda, even if. You've got used to certain things, and that's fine. If certain things have changed for the better, then keep it that way. But otherwise, we need to move on. Gareth, did the wedding what feel you... different compared to? Sorry, sorry. Uh, did, did the wedding feel different compared to um, other weddings you've been to? Purely because people were together again and in a in a public space and interacting and socializing and even um, hugging and. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's why I'm, that's why I'm saying it felt like you know, pre COVID weddings. And it also felt like, um, it felt like, like we, we were all celebrating the good stuff, you know, human beings mm -hmm. who are in love with each other and getting married and, you know, none of that kind of muted celebration that we've seen over the last while. I remember that last wedding I went to was a, was a, a dry wedding because the president had banned oh, yes. alcohol consumption at wedding venues and so on. So it felt very, very different to that one. I mean, they were both magic in their own ways, but, at this one, you could actually celebrate. You know, you could actually have a party. And South Africans don't know how to do that without without drinking. So <laughs> we kind of had to do that. And it was great. Gareth, but what, I did, um, I what Ubered all the, way, all the way there and back. And, uh, and, and that was, I mean, it's quite far. So it was like a 500 rand trip one way and a 500 rand trip the other way. But it mm -hmm. was worth it. You know. mm. What if this is you with some sort of superpowers? What if you have been what we are waiting for in these times. <laughs> you went to a wedding just before we went into lockdown. What if you going to a wedding now is us going back to normal? What if you were the key in all of this? <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd love to believe I had superpowers, mm. but I, I don't think I do. Speaking of superpowers, though, apparently some dude accidentally took one Moderna and one Pfizer vaccine. He obviously you know, had the injection for one and then forgot which one that was. So you got the Moderna and the Pfizer instead of two of the same. And uh, people are wondering, like, you know, is this going to be bad for him or is it going to maybe develop superpowers in him? You never know. <laughs> mm. What never is? Know the yeah, you could end up being very, very powerful, right? Like the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> yeah. Mm. As soon as exactly. I s heard about this mix-up, though, I thought, oh, wait a minute. I love South Africa, but this feels like something that could happen here with the mix-up of admin and whatnot. But his name <laughs> is Craig Richards, and yeah. he's from New Hampshire in the U.S. So his first dose was the 
Moderna one, and then the second one was meant to be the Pfizer one, but really it was all a, an admin mix-up. And he only noticed, you know, they have those vaccine cards afterwards. And he noticed right. afterwards, he goes, oh, wait a minute. Mm, <laughs> something, wrong something's one. a little wrong here. Yeah. So far, well, if the, he, the if, he grows a, if he grows a penis out of his forehead or, he, or his feet grow wings <laughs> like uh, the God Hermes, then we know we've got something going on, right? Yeah, <laughs> let's see. Um, the New Hampshire's Department of Health and Human Services so far has declined to comment further on what the situation will be due to the lack of data regarding mixing vaccines. But what if this is it? What if he takes, how many variations are there of these vaccines, like four or five? Mm. Uh, what if yeah. he takes all of them? <laughs> I, I'm worried. Oh, yeah. I'm worried for his sake now. Can you imagine well, the panic? I, I mean, I would have... I would have shut down or, or I would have gone wild and had parties and said goodbye to everyone. <laughs> mm. You know, I mean, it's likely nothing will happen. It's likely that, um, that this person will be absolutely fine. But, you know, this is just, this, this shows you that, again, none of this is really um, territory that we've ever been down before. And while vaccines are not, nothing new, um, this happens to people, you know, sometimes people get medication for something. I mean, you can even hear it just in, in terms of something we spoke to Nina Hasty about last week, and that's like mental health medication. And people, some people react very, very badly to something and they have side effects that nobody else does because we're all different, right? Yeah. And, um, and you, you, you never know. Like every single time anything happens to you, uh, you need to take, uh, <laughs> you need to take cognizance of the fact that everyone is different and we all have different genes and we all have different ingredients in our cells and uh, you never really know what's going to happen this craig dude is very you know sound and sounds responsible and reasonable because if it yeah. were if this for example happened to me i'd be screaming and shouting from the rooftops with anxiety but he actually says with you everything and going on you, you, you yeah. and leanne are not good in a crisis in fact I know you two. If if we were in the zombie apocalypse, I really would. I would. I love you both, but there's no way I'd have either of you on my team. <laughs> I don't want to take it personally. I get it. I get oh it. He, oh. he just said he feels physically fine, um, mm -hmm. and yes, there's so much conflicting information right now. But he's just taking that in small doses. You know, he right. says with everything going on with the Johnson and Johnson. Uh, vaccine being pulled in some cases, for example, he was feeling a little uneasy about the whole thing, but right now he's just fine. And, you know, th thinking about it, if it was someone else, they could have also seen a money-making opportunity here by, you know, taking Listen, the, the the health board to court and trying to make money off that, you know? Are you, are you mm -hmm. kidding? If, if, if he does develop superpowers, I'm going to go and get exactly the same mixture he got. So one, <laughs> hello, could I please have one Moderna and one Pfizer? I also want to be able to fly. I'd like the Craig <laughs> Richards special, please. <laughs> exactly. You should market it. If that works, I mean, imagine if they discovered something like that entirely by mistake. So they're giving you a vaccine for COVID, but it ends up like curing some other problem that humans have had for thousands of years. And it was completely by chance, just a fluke. That would be amazing. Mm. <laughs> Let's take um, those notes. Rickus says, Gareth, imagine going back to the studio and you have to be in traffic at 5 a.m. on a winter's morning. Oh. Well, funny, funny you should mention that, Rickus, because I went to, um, I saw my sister yesterday and I actually left my laptop there and I had to wake up this morning at 5, which I would normally have done oh, going into the no. studio. Oh, and no. drive to her. Luckily, she's not so far away, but I had to drive to her and grab my laptop otherwise we wouldn't be able to do the show this morning so that mm. was that was sort of it's interesting you bring that up and we're talking about going back to normal but it sort of felt a bit weird being up at five and i often think when we do the show we're up so early and it's just us the roads are busy man there's cyclists there are people driving mm -hmm. to work you know shops are being opened up you can see there's a lot of activity at 5 a.m so that's uh, that's already happening whether you like it or not that's an, it's good to hear that people are out and about. <laughs> but uh, I can already tell that now we are, I know to talk about the weather, rolls eyes, but I can already mm. tell that my morning schedule now has to change slightly. You wake up and you already go, oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, there's already, I, already that aspect. Mm. I had to get the so, heater on this morning, actually, for the first time. 
I've heard there are some people who are already in electric blanket territory and uh, heated territory. So, see if you, you're in that group, I feel I feel sorry for you. I think that's outrageous. Outrageous. No, I think it's I've the been time. denying. I've been denying the cold actually, uh, especially oh, yeah. because we're more in, indoors lately. I just I, I kind of pretended that it's it's not coming yet, <laughs> but this mm. morning I woke up with a bit of a shock. I must admit. Yeah, you're definitely. I, I need in to denial. seek out my my winter winnerdies. Yeah. Um, the uh, the comment from Pichleng is, and maybe you can help us here. Leanne, you're a, apparently a resident sleep expert. Can you please give us tips on how to wake up early or on time during the winter months? I don't want to slag behind. That's from um, Pichleng. Can you help us? Um. Hmm. Yeah. Well. Oh. There you are. Has she gone it seems to sleep? frozen on my side. I don't know if you can still hear me. No, no, we're, we're, we're good now. We're good. Go ahead. Oh. No, Ash is definitely gone. I'm going to remove her and she can come back later. So, in Pichleng, obviously no answer from Leanne there for you. I'm sorry about that. Terrible. I think, so, um, I think it's ironic she went back to sleep. Yeah. Uh, KP says, electric blankets went on the bed yesterday. It was toasty last night. Good for you. I can't do that. My rule is um, 1st of May is the absolute earliest you're allowed to do any of that. The earliest So then you're going ever. to suffer before that? Of course. I would rather be, listen, you can use blankets. It's not suffering. It's, what, do you, what do you think people did before electric blankets and they survived? <laughs> Come on, Sia, really. You know, don't be so weak. Don't no. Be so weak and weak. No, it's absolutely true. All right, so there's Leanne. Uh, hello, Ass. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, so we, for the sleeping thing. He wanted some advice. Go ahead. There's so many bits and bobs out there and sleeping tips and go to bed early. And But for me, it's it's always difficult to wake up that early, especially in winter. So you, you actually have to motivate yourself with other things, like I will lose my job. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if I don't get up, I'll lose my job. If I don't get up, Basically, I'll not be able to pay my bills. I will be hungry. Right. Go for the hard <sighs> uh, stuff from the animal. She's just she's giving you like the, the reasons that you absolutely cannot argue with yourself at that time in the morning. Like, I will go hungry and uh, and lose my job. All right. Very nice. Yes. So negative and motivation. Then, and, and then what you do is you, you cry in the shower and then you release all of that <laughs> and then go about your day. Oh I thought God. you were going right. to perhaps recommend a YouTube channel that plays harps all the time. So that's how you can wake up with ease. Yeah, exactly. I thought there'd be something positive in there, but look at her. She goes straight <laughs> to it. Okay. Um, I, I want to just quickly, before we go to the news, bring this up because I think it's so stupid. So Emma Watson um, was in the news this weekend. That's uh, the girl from Harry Potter. And she mm -hmm. said... Uh, she said in, a, in an interview over the weekend, she's not single. She is, and listen to this term, self-partnered. Self-partnered. That's what she's calling being single. Self-partnered. It's like a fancy way of saying no one will have me or I don't think, uh, I think I'm too good for everyone else. That's basically what she's calling it. Self-partnered. So do we take this seriously or do we think this is just a typical Hollywood thing where she said something, maybe she was even joking in an interview and people got upset with her, uh, or, or they quoted her, and now suddenly they've got a story. I mean, is this a nothing? Well, it sounds like Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin with um, conscious uncoupling. Remember yes. that when they right. were getting a divorce? Yeah. Right. New terminology that's just nonsense, right? That just doesn't make sense. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, Leanne mm. Moll says she's having huge trouble with her Wi-Fi, so we're just going to get her back on. And, and while she's getting back on, we do have lots of news. I'm going to get to the headlines, and we can start with those. And then uh, Sia and I want to talk a little bit about um, Prince Philip's funeral, which was another big story from the weekend. And we've got uh, a bunch of other things on the agenda this morning. Also, we're starting something brand new this morning. It is, um, it's called... Uh, well, it's about collections. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter what it's called. It's about collections. Um, everybody, and you know the mania, it's called collectomania. Sorry, you know, I need to. It's like African analysis, collectomania. We've got names for everything. Anyway, the point of this thing is that we're going to discuss all the collections 
that people have. Some people collect you know, stamps, some people collect coins, some people collect books, some people collect 200 different things. And um, everybody's got one, basically. And we're going to be talking about these over the course of the next couple of weeks. And uh, the reason we decided to do this is because we've been talking to the guys from the South African Gold Coin Exchange. Um, and I've actually I've bought some stuff from them before. Because if there's anything to collect, it's precious metals, right? And we all know because we've spoken over the years to the guys at Troy Gold and uh, in a number of different places, uh, even Anthea all those years ago, we used to talk about whether or not you should have some precious metals and some gold in your portfolio. And people are taking all of that very seriously because we're in such strange times and you need to know what you can rely on and what's valuable. And you might be collecting something that's very valuable. So we'll talk about that in the uh, course of this morning's discussions. But the developing story this morning in Cape Town, apparently strong winds have fanned that Cape Town fire and there are more evacuations on the way. The city's disaster uh, risk management spokesperson Charlotte Powell has said residents in two streets in Frederhoek have been evacuated as a precautionary measure. So the first big headline for the morning is that people in Cape Town are being told in certain places, especially back up against the mountain, um, towards that spur on which the Rhodes Memorial lives and Hospital Bend, that area, and going down into the City Bowl, people are being told to uh, keep an eye and to evacuate if necessary. But of course, emergency services are on the scene trying to contain and deal with that fire as we speak. So horrible, horrible scenes unfolding in Cape Town. And I hope that you, know, you are safe. That's such a traumatic thing. Now, yes, these are just headlines and we get into stories. Sometimes we gloss over it. I've never had to evacuate my home right. ever. What do you do when you hear that? Is there well, just are, are there alarms in the community? Do you just keep up to date with social media? What do you take? Do you take an overnight bag? Do you take a, a suitcase because you, you, you don't know you what's going to happen? You don't usually have time to get a whole lot of stuff, so you can really only pack what's absolutely essential. And uh, you know, we often talk on the, on the show just in general terms about like what you would save if your house was burning down, but. Oh. It, I think it's just a panic and you, you just get out with whatever you absolutely need at that moment, you know, money, passports, that kind of stuff, and you just go. But, um, but emergency services are pretty good in Cape Town when it comes to this. And I know that there are helicopters that are dumping water on the fire as, as we speak. They have been. The thing is, it, it starts, so, so when I was living in Cork Bay, there was a, I, I lived on, on the mount, on the side of the mountain and we were the first house that would have been um, hit by the fire had it got to us. Sure. But it was, so, it was so close that you could no longer see much in the house or where you were because of the smoke. Oh. Um, the, you were breathing in ashes um, and everything was covered in, in ashes. Um, I was actually in Johannesburg at the time for work and um, I, I was following the fire during the night and I had all my pets at, at the house mm. and I had these, when you're not there, it's so difficult and you're being sent pictures by the neighbours and the pictures are mainly flame. Yeah. Um, and I actually got onto the first flight that I could because I was following it during the night and the anxiety was too much. And you get there and people aren't actually panicking. They're kind of just really? walking around, talking about it, standing in the street, watching it, trusting the firefighters because our firefighters in Cape Town are really world class. And um, yes, there's talk about what will we do if we have to move out. But you know, it's not as, it doesn't happen as quickly all the time, depending on the winds. Um, it's but you do get plenty of warning with all of the ash and the smoke and all of that sort it's of not, thing. It's not like you'd suddenly wake up and be chased out of your house. I mean, it's you, there's there is a bit of a build up here, and obviously, uh, the, the, you know, the fire can spread very quickly, but you would know it wouldn't just happen. You wouldn't wake up this morning and go, Oh my god, you know, got to well, rush because out. If, yeah. if that was the case, I'd just hear my mother's voice in my head because she always, always says, make sure you look good and you're dressed well when you sleep. Because <laughs> the last Listen. thing you want is if you fall ill or if there's an emergency and then now you're rushing around with underwear with a big hole. In yeah, that's something my grandmother would say. 
And mm. I was I was I was stuck in um in Munich in a hotel room. I was with my brother. We went with a whole lot of friends and uh woke up in the middle of the night after a particularly um wild oh. evening and woke up to this ear piercing alarm and repetition of a few sentences in three languages, one after the other. <laughs> Just not knowing where we were when we woke up. I, I remember I woke up and my brother was standing on the bed trying to find some kind of switch or speaker to turn it off. But it was a, a fire alarm and it was oh. because there was a fire in the basement of the hotel. Um, and we were only, you know, two or three floors up. Um, so we all, all in the middle of the night were evacuated into the street. Um, they cordoned everything off. Two friends of ours in, in one of the rooms who were sharing were unaccounted for. Um, uh. And yes, yeah, I was standing there in my pajamas with no bra, and I, that's all I could think Ooh. about. <laughs> it's all I could think about. It was the absolute worst. Anyway, the two, just to let you know, the two that were unaccounted for slept through the entire thing. <laughs> and I don't know how, but they, they slept through the entire thing and woke up and came down to breakfast once everything had been cleared. Oh, was it just, <laughs> it was yeah. just a nervous, smooth evening for them. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a bizarre story. Um, the grieving widow of slain Lindani Mieni said on Sunday it was imperative that all body cam footage be released to show what transpired the night her husband was killed. The 29-year-old former KwaZulu-Natal rugby player was shot and killed in Hawaii on Wednesday. The incident happened after police responded to a burglary. A scuffle ensued and Mieni was shot. Four days after the news of her husband's death, his widow, Lindsay, is still processing the incident. He's such a special person. I can't believe God gave him to me. I feel so blessed and I'm beyond upset about this. Um, adding that her grief, uh, adding to her grief was the uncertainty around the circumstances of her husband's death and the police's involvement in it. So this is in Hawaii, in Honolulu. They released some body cam footage, but Mieni said selective release is not good enough. She believes Lindani's race did play a part in the tragedy. So suddenly we have, you know, the police being racist and a South African involvement, a real South African involvement mm. in this. And obviously, you know, America is just so incendiary at the moment. Everything is a, a race issue. And, you know, the police, even even in, in situations where you would normally say the police are completely justified to do something, now they have to prove that they are justified to do something and they've all got body cams on. So people are asking for that body cam footage to be shown. And here we have a South African guy. I wonder what they were doing in Hawaii. Do you think they lived there? or? I mean, that's uh, I didn't know yeah. who this this Lindani Mieni was, but apparently he and his wife, Lindsay, um, have been living in Hawaii for some time. So I don't know much about them, but uh, a very sad story nonetheless. And we obviously will wait for the, the details to emerge from that. Mm. Oof, what um, a shocking thing to have to look at that footage. Yeah. Uh, this is why when police, it's released, yeah. But this is why police have to wear it these days, because if they don't wear those body cams, you know, that they could be accused of all kinds of things. And we also want to know that the police are acting within the law. So <clears throat> it keeps them on their toes too. The state capture inquiry will be beefing up its security. This comes after the officers in the Hillside House office park in Parktown were burgled on Saturday night. Commission Secretary Professor Tumileng Masala says that they have only found one computer and one monitor missing so far. He says that this doesn't really affect the work of the commission in any way. We don't want to be dramatic about this thing. It could very well have been petty criminals, he says. Mm. But the, the State Capture Commission and everything we have here is sensitive and we don't want to take any chances. So they're going to be beefing up security there. Um, ironic that this, in a week where we've got three people, um, obviously President, uh, former President Jacob Zuma, uh, Ace Mahashule, and now Lucky Montana, who is the guy in charge just a short while ago of, um, of Prasa, these three have all said that the State Capture Commission is a witch hunt. And uh, they have mm. good reason to be afraid of the State Capture Commission because all of their corruption is coming to the fore. And none of them like it very much. Now, in a related story, South Africa's municipalities are not only in a financial and political mess, but also appear to be led by incompetent officials. That is thanks to information. Oh, came uh, what? I, I, I can't believe that. You'd never have thought that. 
But um, this came to, to light in a parliamentary reply. Of 2,747 senior municipal officials, only 1,500 met minimum competency levels. Mm-mm. Just over half. Mm-mm. That is what acting minister in the presidency, Kumbutso Njaveni, uh, revealed when replying to a question from the DA MP, Silias Brink. Prescribed minimum competency levels were introduced 13 years ago for municipal managers, CFOs, supply chain managers, and other people working in finance and procurement. Further in the reply, it emerged only 128 of the country's 248 chief financial officers, those are the men and women in charge of municipal finances, achieved mm. minimum competence minimum oh competence. my word and this is these are competency levels that were set 13 years ago yeah so imagine how we were using computers and, and operations and systems and software in those days right <laughs> oh my god so apparently 53 percent of all municipal senior managers met competency levels um this is only mildly promising, but not acceptable, and much work needs to be done," said Chaveni in her response. I mean, you do think. me a favor. Yeah, you That's think. That's a bit of an understatement. You know, it's. Oh, this no, is, no wonder. Yeah. So, if you want to know why your municipality is a complete disaster, it's because they've put some cater in there who has no qualifications, no competency in their area of specialization at all. And we're not talking about the the the, the figureheads. We're not talking about the you know, the mayor of a town who has to walk around and cut ribbons. We're talking about the chief financial officer of these municipalities. That is absolutely damning. Can you, imagine being, can you imagine being one of the people who are qualified and competent and you've, you've worked there for, the, for years, you know the systems, no. and you're trying to do everything right, but you're carrying this burden of half of your business or your corporation that's not, not a corporation, half of your office place doesn't know what they're doing. You're That's, carrying all of that. It's Whoa, what, what a terrible job. Absolutely. But then I, I, I don't know if you guys saw this play out online over the weekend as well, the EFF and the DA going at it between each other around who had what qualification and who got this and who has a university degree and who doesn't. And yeah. I don't know when all of this is just going to end because every it's single so politician much, and political you know, party will take any it's opportunity not, to go against it's not each having other. A, it's not having a degree. The problem I have here is that if you are the CFO of, of a municipality, you're financially responsible for the, for the books of that municipality. You know, we used to, we used to do this uh, feature with the guys from, um, from the, the, the chartered accountants, what are they called? Um, Psyche. 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 We used to do a, a regular update with Psyche. You have to be okayed by them. Otherwise, you're not allowed to run the, 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 the finances of a business. You're not allowed to. And a, a municipality even more so because that's taxpayers' money. It's not private money. You know? Good heavens. Mm. Oh, gosh. So there we go. These people are not fit for the job. They must be fired. There's Actually, half the municipal managers in this country that need to take themselves out of the job before we come and get them. Thinking about both of these stories, this particular one and also the um, robbery at the State Capture Commission, if it was part of a movie plot, wouldn't yeah. you look at that and go, Ugh, that's so far-fetched. Come on now. Exactly. <laughs> that would be so but stupid. You would. You'd think this but is ludicrous, yet, right? Like yeah. State Capture Commission officers being burgled you'd go ah this is too this is too ridiculous but here we are living it and tracy says they're at least competent enough to be corrupt that's about right i mean ain't that the truth uh winnie says it's just connections come on no data even in the private sector it's all just connections it's like yeah you get this job because you know the person who appoints people there that's how it works in South Africa. It's very, very upsetting. Finally, NASA, NASA's Mars, Mars uh, helicopter, the Ingenuity, could make its first flight over the red planet as soon as Monday. This is absolutely amazing. So inside of, of all of that equipment that they managed to land on Mars was a helicopter, which apparently can take off and fly over the surface of the planet and take video and pictures. Isn't that amazing? How oh, crazy. 
So apparently it'll mark the first ever powered controlled flight on another planet and will help NASA to reap invaluable data about the conditions on Mars. NASA is targeting no earlier than Monday, April the 19th, that's today, for the first flight of its Ingenuity Mars helicopter, the space agency reported on Saturday. Data will return to Earth a few hours following the autonomous flight, which would take off at approximately 3.30 a.m. Ingenuity's first trip was initially set for last Sunday, but was delayed after a potential issue emerged during a high-speed test of the four-pound helicopter's rotors. Isn't that incredible? That's really great. I was so going to say, imagine, imagine having NASA's team come and fix up our municipality for a week. But, <laughs> no, well, that's the, that's but, the level of capacity we need. But the thing is, I think a lot of it would just not even touch sides with them because they're, they're too clever. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, listen, they could probably sort. You, you, didn't, you don't need to be a genius. You don't need to be a rocket scientist, literally, to, to sort out. Yeah. You just need someone who's honest and someone who's empowered to make the decisions and come in and clean the place out. And all of these ANC cadres who've been deployed must be fired. I don't care if that ends up putting their families into poverty. It is not the responsibility of the state to give sheltered employment to incompetent people. That is not what we have a government for. Municipalities in this country are failing left, right, and center, falling apart. People have sewerage problems, water and electricity supply problems, um, all kinds of problems with billing, um, urban planning. Some of these municipalities, these towns are falling apart. The little towns in South Africa are falling apart because they managed so badly. And the people who live there ultimately carry the can. These people must be fired and they must be put in jail if they've stolen money. In jail. Finished and clar. Jeez. All right, so that's all the news that you need to know this morning. Um, I, I don't know. Did you watch any of Prince Philip's funeral, Leanne? Um, I watched bits on YouTube. I watched oh. one particular, particular clip where the, they'd made this huge headline about how the queen had wiped a tear during the ceremony. <laughs> well, I think what, what annoyed me about watching any of it would have been the media coverage of it. Oh yeah, that's sick. Why? Imagine how people feel nonsense instead of just watching the show. So my parents watched it. They, they, they got like a nice big pot of tea and they sat and watched the whole thing. I was at the wedding that I told you about. So I actually didn't see it live. But when I got back home on Saturday night, at about, I don't know, 11 o'clock in the evening, mm -hmm. I, um, I decided I'd PVR'd it, so I decided I'd watch the whole thing. So I spent like an extra two hours, got to sleep really late on Saturday night. But it was, um, it was great to watch. And I mean, what an incredible ceremony. Oh, I, it, it, it feels almost horrible and slightly distasteful for me to have been so enamored with this whole ceremony so much but i want to use this word because it's fitting in my opinion it was iconic there was mm. just it was classic it was regal it was beautiful it was protocol and procedure it was the outfits yeah. it was the glamour it was oh Fabulous. Well, uh, and Snyder yes, it was said, very touching. It's a funeral. Nice says it was the most properly executed funeral I've seen. It was just mm. meticulous beyond belief. You know, if you consider the chaos around Madiba's funeral a couple of years ago, where, you know, people were just like, they tried to put on a show, but everything was late. This didn't happen in time, even though the military involved, half of them couldn't march properly. You remember what a mess that was compared to, and it wasn't that bad. I mean, you know, there've been worse ones. But you just think about this. It was, it was time to the second. Every piece of music was, was selected personally by Prince Philip. Um, the, the various regiments and, and military services that were present were looking spectacular. You know when someone has polished every single part of a uniform to, to a point where it shines? My God, it was magnificent. I mean, to see all of that splendor and then the mm -hmm. sadness, the personal sadness of you know, the family that were, that were all represented there and I just thought it was beautifully done and it was almost worth abandoning the idea that this was a, a slimmed and trimmed down version of it for COVID. Because I think with this happening in COVID, we might have seen things that we never saw before because there would have mm. been so many people. You would have had the crowds. They would have been focused on the crowds. In this, we could be focused purely on the ceremony 
and purely yeah. on this you know small 30 person um congregation who was saying goodbye to a family member it was very personal it was very beautiful i thought it was magnificent and moving in every single way mm. there was a man just the fact that it was so tiny as well humanized it more for me and i felt extra sad for the queen and it was the fact that maybe there weren't a lot of people around her the fact that they all were sitting separately i just wanted to go up there and hug her and then i mm. saw them the handwritten note that she wrote for prince mm. philip i thought oh be still oh. my flaming heart and there was just I'll go back to using the word iconic again. There was just this every so often when they'd cut to her, she was just sitting there looking down. So you didn't even see much of her eyes because of the, yeah. of the wide brimmed hat and her mask. And then the mask, yeah, was, you, you could, it, it was almost like she was in a hijab, you know? Ah, uh, man. No, I, I, it, for me, every, everything about that was, was beautiful. But there was one final moment that and i wouldn't say i cried but yeah you it's enough to sit there and you go a little misty eye did you watch right towards the end um up until prince philip's coffin was taken down and underneath mm -hmm. as his his full title and all of his titles was read were read out yeah all right, uh, you want to see the video? Here it is. So we'll, we'll play this quickly. The most excellent order of the British Empire, Lord High Admiral of the United Kingdom, one of Her Majesty's most honorable Privy Council, Admiral of the Fleet, Field Marshal in the Army, and Marshal of the Royal Air Force, husband of Her Most Excellent Majesty, Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, Sovereign of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, whom may God preserve and bless with long life, health and honor, and all worldly happiness. Um, that's amazing. Uh, uh, <laughs> All those those bagpipes warming up. It's just the most eerie sound, isn't it? I mean, I've, oh. I've always thought that bagpipes have got a horrible sound to my ear, but it's it's just so um, it's such a spooky instrument. It really is. Anyway, that guy is called Garter King of Arms, and you'll see one day when the Queen is buried, you know, whether it's soon or whether it's a long time from now. Um, what he actually does when the queen is buried, he reads out all of her titles and styles as well. And then he breaks his stick of office and he throws it into the grave with her. It's, oh. he's, the, he's the last it's quite person. dramatic. Very dramatic, yeah. Because, you know, all, all his offices and all the, everyone in, in a kingdom like that, they owe their office to the, the sovereign. And when the sovereign dies, they have to basically get it renewed by the new one or else they lose their jobs. Of course, it's all symbolic, but Garter King of Arms is in charge of all the the um, the royal announcements and the the the, the big. He's a herald, um, you know, in the in the old way that a herald would go around announcing the news to people. And um, Garter King of Arms is someone Sia and I actually met. Uh, oh, what was Lord, it? Three years ago. Oh. There so he is. There you can oh. see his arms better. I still can't see why yeah. he's the King of Arms. So, yeah, his name is uh, Thomas Woodcock. He's the Garter King of Arms. Yeah. C and I really? met him. Woodcock, really? Yes, Woodcock. Yeah, yeah keep it together. <laughs> Isn't that when, when Sia was falling asleep in the office? That's, that's yes. exactly So, Sia, uh, Sia was sitting in the office with me um, at, in this ancient, ancient building, which is... I mean, it was built around the time of King Charles II, and, and it's called the College of Arms. And we're in, we're in Garter's study, and he's busy what talking to me about hot, Gary. It, was stuffy. It, was, it was in the middle of summer in London, and it was very stuffy and humid. 
And, and the College of Arms is right on the Thames River. And they're surrounded by all of these ancient, ancient books and scrolls and texts. And, and Garter and, and York Herald, the other guy you could see in that picture, are busy talking to me and we're recording it for the show. And um, in fact, you could still listen to it. I think it's on cliffcentral.com. Yeah. And see, and I, I mean, I was really fascinated by this guy. It was probably one of the highlights of, of that trip for me. And uh, what is Sia doing? He's like falling asleep at the table, <laughs> like nodding off. Don't you wish you'd paid attention now, Sia? Didn't I tell you that this guy was important? I know you did. I know. <laughs> but of all moments, and we did great things on that trip, you know, of all yeah. moments, could I not have dozed off in the underground in a cab uh -huh. while we were at lunch? Um, that was the time. <laughs> 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 the doze off. <laughs> I just felt <laughs> flustered all over again now. That is not good. Not good at all. <laughs> oh, dear. I thought, so, uh, right. just, just the last word on the, on the, the royal funeral, I thought that um, Princess Anne and, and Prince Charles really were extremely dignified and did a, a terrific job of kind of putting that stiff upper lip in place and just making sure that everything... You know, and I'm sure that they had a lot to do with things too. Um, but as the eldest two two children of, um, of Prince Philip and the Queen, I, I you know I've, I know lots of people say things about Prince Charles, and you know a lot of people think he's a bit weak, and some people say he's he's a disastrous person because of he you know he, he messed up the uh, the marriage with Diana, and he had the affair with Camilla, and you know that Charles has always been a bit sensitive and awkward. But I must tell you, I think that he's. He's every part, every bit the part that he, he needs to play. And, you know, I think that he and Camilla are suddenly starting to realize, you know, their responsibilities are just around the corner because with Prince Philip gone, I don't know how long the queen will last, but that means for Charles and Camilla, serious job up, uh, on the way. Uh, some mm. very important responsibilities are about to take place for them. And I, you could see on Camilla's face, there's like this sudden realization that, oh shit, this is, this is just, <laughs> this is on the way. This is my my road ahead is already. Yeah. Like she she heard all of Prince Philip's titles and thought, "I've got to do all of that before I die." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I, have I did one of, like the other person mm -hmm. who I absolutely love is is that Kate Middleton. My God, she has fitted in there like a glove. She knows exactly what to do. She is. She looks absolutely perfect. She looks beautiful. She she has such an a, a sense of there's something regal about the woman. And I know that everybody, yeah. including me, joke that, you know, her parents are very middle class people and, you know, mom was a flight attendant and all of that stuff. But, you know, that Kate Middleton, the Duchess of Cambridge, as they call her, that woman has, uh, she's got all the ducks in a row. I like her a lot. William, William lucked out with her. You compare her to that trashy Megan and that oh. useless Prince <laughs> Harry. That, that Prince Harry, what, a, what an embarrassment. Even though, even though he picked up and he didn't say anything or do anything terribly embarrassing this time around. I mean, what a, what a stupid loser. He must have felt like such a loser being there because the only attention being paid to him was negative attention, and rightly so. I mean, I know he lost his grandfather, and I'm sorry about that, but really, dude, you have, you have screwed up badly. He must have felt like such a tool. Uh, Kate, for me, was the best dressed at the funeral, not that it matters, but it does to me. And she had that <laughs> bow to the side and the queen had given her a necklace to wear for, for the day. She was, yeah. she looked absolutely gorgeous. Even though I, I think she probably has a personality of a rice cake. <laughs> After seeing her on Saturday, I think I could actually, I, I, I would hang out with I her. Think, I don't think she hasn't, uh, I, I think she knows well enough that her job is not to have a personality and to be loud and to look for attention. She's exactly the opposite and that's precisely what you need in her position. You don't want she someone... She knows her limits. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, she, she is there, she supports her husband who's also one day going to have to take on all of these uh, responsibilities. Slowly but surely they're all taking on more and more of them and a lot of it is symbolism. I mean, I know there are people who just don't care about the royal family at all and who think it's a stupid, outdated, anachronistic business that should be dispensed with. I know lots of people like that. Some of them are family and friends of mine, and we disagree vehemently. I think this stuff is massively important, and I think it makes a country better um, to have institutions, to have traditions, to have a respect for those traditions. It gives you gravity, 
And there are so many countries where everything seems politically to be working very well and it's thoroughly modern, but they just don't have any any real strength, any character, any national identity that's worthy of of mention. And I think that one of the things that makes Britain very special is this idea of the royal family and having a monarch. And it's, you know, a thousand years of doing this. And that has that has some clout, if you ask me. This Kate Middleton, she knows that. She gets that. She knows it's not about her. She stepped into a role and she's going to do her best to fulfill to all of her abilities the role of being a mother to a future king, uh, a wife to a to a future king, and while the others are still around, to do her duty and cause li- as little fuss as possible. And I think that that's really great. And Camilla's the same. You know, everybody always has a go at Camilla, and I, I think that's so unfair. Like, she's not looking for attention. When did you ever see Camilla trying to grab the headlines or dressing uh, up rather than appropriately, trying to make it a, a, a splash? She doesn't do that. She doesn't make comments to the media that are outrageous. She doesn't say and do things that cause trouble. She just quietly gets on with it. I think that's really good. And I've, you know, not really contradicting what you're saying, but I've appreciated this week the glimpses of, hu- is humanity the right word to use? But just to see their humanness. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think we we discussed the first comment, public comment that Prince Charles made after Prince Philip's passing. And I don't know where he was, um, but it seemed like it was a a smaller private property. And he stepped out from the door and stood by the fence and that's where the press was gathered. And he just gave a very quick statement on how he feels about Prince Philip passing. But my takeaway was just even hearing him refer to Prince Philip as Papa. I'm like, oh, yes, it's your father. You know, take all of this pomp and ceremony away. You are just a son who has lost a father. And I I appreciated that. So yes, Leanne, I know it was a headline and then it was a thing taken out and way over and above board. But just to see the queen in the car and she dabbed her eye a little, I was like, yes, you are crying. And I did so on Friday. I was just waiting for that. And I saw that and I was good. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the queen's birthday soon and it'll be the first one without uh, without Philip. So that's that's going to be probably quite hard for her. I don't know. How do you think she, how long do you think she's got? You know, I, I, I mean, she's, I know it's a morbid thing to discuss and some people mm. think it's, uh, it's inappropriate, but you know how when, when one partner dies after you've been together for a very long time and she's in her 90s, how long she's got to go? Snae says, I'm not sure if the royal family will even be sovereign leaders in the UK after Queen Elizabeth's death. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, but people have predicted the fall of the monarchy so many times before. And it hasn't happened, Snay. I don't think that that's going to change. I think that they are entrenched in society in a way that you you can't get rid of them. And even if the monarchy becomes less and less important constitutionally, um, like in countries across Europe, Denmark, you know, um, Spain, those monarchs are really just figureheads. They'll still have a role. Um, at the moment, you know that, that there isn't a constitution in the United Kingdom. It's all just a gentleman's agreement between the sovereign parliament and the prime minister and if someone breaks that gentleman's agreement there can be a constitutional crisis of a kind Mm. anyway it is seven o'clock we do have to get to um, all the other stuff and we've got uh, something brand new for you a little bit later collectomania which i think is going to be lots of fun we'll talk about all the things that people collect and there are so many interesting categories of of things there so we're getting to all of that just now cliffcentral.com it is a monday it's the 19th of april Seven o'clock. Do you suffer from collectivism, collectivity, collectionitis? Do you have an obsession with objects? Are you a fanatic, a devotee, an aficionado? Cliff Central dispenses a weekly dose of collectomania. Join me as I talk to compulsive collectors. Fascinating, intriguing, possibly a little weird. Collectomania, Mondays on The Gareth Cliff Show. Brought to you by SA Gold Coin Exchange and The Scoin Shop.
They would bleed you, put leeches on you. Can you imagine beating the king? He pulled down his pants and pee in the middle of a concert recital. He didn't even know his wife. The first time he saw was at the time they were going to get married. The sons were maniacs, first European aristo trash. Probably the cleverest person to have sat on the throne of England. rapidly changing world, but how we get paid remains stubbornly outdated. We have this archaic payday cycle. The Future of Pay is a podcast series that explores the impact that the current salary status quo has on South Africans. When you are desperate, you will do anything to get that money to put food on your table for your family by tomorrow evening. And how innovative startup SmartWage is looking to change things. It's a very simple problem here. People are waiting till the end of the month to get paid. And the impact is that they can't afford expenses that come up during the middle of the month. The Future of Pay, brought to you by SmartWage, available on cliffcentral.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, central.com. Good morning. It's Monday, the 19th of April. Leanna, you're right. We heard some, someone fall or something break in the background. Are you okay? <laughs> and um, the camera's not on, so I can't even tell. I'm here. Right. Are, you, uh, are you right? We heard a bang and a smash. Are you all right? <laughs> I forgot that I'd left. Did you hear a bang and a smash? No. Yes. No. Well, sort of like a thump. Okay, so this is embarrassing, but um, oh. I this part isn't this part isn't embarrassing. Um, that I live in a in an old house that was built nearly a hundred years ago, and yeah. it um, because of the wooden floors and it's you know it's not it's um, it's it's seeing it's seen its days. Yes. And in the, in the entrance hall where I was now, um, the I have a glass cabinet. With uh -huh. filled with glass items, and when yeah. you walk across the floorboards, the entire thing rattles. <laughs> oh. So that's that's what you heard. And in in fact, um, some of my friends and family refuse to walk past it because they say it makes them feel fat. <laughs> mm. Well, <laughs> listen. In that case, that's not so embarrassing. That's nice. <laughs> so, you can so that's all it was. So what what kind of glass things are in there? Oh, um, I've got some, um, you know, carafes and um, bowls and plates and things like is that. It, is Nothing. It, is, it sort of, um, is it is it crystal stuff? I mean, is it fancy? No, that's in another cupboard. Okay. I've got more fancy but, things in another cupboard. You know, since, since we're talking about collections later on, I think we might have uh, oh, of course, yes. stumbled into something that you collect, but we'll we'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, I've got that's some feed the east yeah. wing of Leanne's yeah, that's home. An, correct, uh, Leanne's east wing on the principal floor. All right, so oh. here are some some emails that we've got. This first one's from Carol, who wants to talk about the burning platform last week and said she would have liked to have heard more of what Dumo had to say. Please bring him back and give him more time to speak. And then Claudia says, I'm not sure if you'll get this message or even care. I mean, why start like that, Claudia? But uh, listening to the burning platform last week was frustrating. Dumo had great points to make, and both Gareth and Pumi would not let him finish a single thought. Damon can shout mindlessly for 10 minutes, but when someone has something valid to discuss, they get cut short. Don't think it's intentional, and I'll gladly accept I'm not a broadcaster and I know nothing. I just think it would have been nice to hear the man complete a topic. All right, so Claudia and Carol both saying we needed to give Dumo more time. So we'll get him back, I promise. And I, I apologize. Sometimes, you know. Sometimes you've got things that need saying and you interrupt people and I sometimes do that too often. 
So apologies, Claudia and Carol. Yeah, we, we, mm. we, we, we can't make everybody happy all the time, but I appreciate the feedback. And then this is from uh, Colette. So Claudia Carol Colette, all with C's. Uh, Colette says, I've just read your article on Prince Philip, and while all your writings are articulate and considered, this one is really, really cool. You captured the essence of a man and monarchy that are often misunderstood with compassion and sensitivity, put into words um, what uh, others may disagree with. Your morning shows make the start to many people's days so much better, especially the days with Leanne. That's nice, Leanne. Mm. She's, uh, but of course. <laughs> Colette also says you need to write a book about your life. So yes, that's very we nice. know. Thanks, Colette. Well, thank you, Colette. <laughs> yeah. That's very, very nice of you. So some, some nice feedback there. Um, there are also some, some more comments about uh, all the, 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 the Prince Philip stuff over the weekend. So I think we'll probably get one or two more of those in here. Apparently, according to Corona's uh, boring, the Queen only has another 257 years left in her. So, <laughs> you know, oh, only. Well, yes. I mean, look, look at her mother. And obviously their, their health has been prioritized their whole lives. Um, yeah. and, and also earlier to your statement, Gareth, about the fact that sometimes if one spouse dies, the other one follows suit quite soon. I think yeah. she's she's so used to, even though Prince Philip was at her side for so many reasons and in so many ways, she's so used to performing independently um, yeah. in her thoughts and her thinking and her ways and her whole life. Um, so I don't I don't see that happening. I must be honest. Really, you know, it's, it's interesting that um, maybe maybe she's going to carry on for a while. I mean, she's certainly in, in you know she's in great condition for an older lady, and she she does have a huge support system. So it's not as if she she shouldn't be able to keep going. But it does sometimes happen that when one goes, then the other one goes. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's it's time for me to to kind of give up and. You know, I've seen these stories. I mean, my great grandparents, um, they were married for a very, very long time. And I think they also just made, I think they either made 80 or 90, but they were, they were up there. And the one went and literally two days later, wow. the other one was gone. Wow. Um, so it, it does happen. But, you know, uh, they, they lowered Philip into that vault, which uh, Sia was talking about earlier. He thought that was the most moving part of the whole ceremony. Now he's going to sit there and wait well, lie there and wait um, until the queen dies, until he goes into his permanent storage facility. Oh, really? Yeah. Storage Dive. facility? Can you dignify it differently, please, Gareth? <laughs> well, well, it's okay. called a cupboard. It's called a cupboard, uh, but they... This, um... <laughs> this is something very, very cool that, that I can claim a personal knowledge of that I don't think a lot of people have. I've actually been into the Royal Vault, okay, under St. George's wow. Chapel. Wow. There's a behind that altar that you saw where all Philip's stuff was, you know, displayed, all of his decorations. Behind that, there's a little staircase that leads down um, into the, the, the vault underneath St. George's Chapel. Because behind St. George's Chapel is, a, is another little building called the Albert Memorial Chapel. And underneath that, directly underneath that, is a room of exactly the same size as the Albert Memorial Chapel. It's got shelves, three shelves along the two sides and an altar at the end. Um, and it's got three slabs in the middle. They're just concrete stone, uh, you know, concrete, but covered in, in York stone slabs. And it's a, it's a sort of, it's a dark little room. Obviously it's under a, you know, it's in the, in the undercroft of a chapel. So it's, it's, it's deep, it's dark, it's dank, it's cold. And mm. they will put Prince Philip's coffin on one of those slabs for him to wait for the queen so that they can both be buried together in the King George the sixth Memorial wow. chapel, which is off to the side. But in, in that vault are, are about, I think 20 or 30 coffins already of deceased members of the Royal family going all the way back to 1804. Yeah. I think he'll be the 24th. Wow. That's yes. That's no, the, something like that. What, but that's what happens. That's not what we're Yeah. What's hap what happens with people who are divorced or who are single at their time of death? Do they just go in alone? So I know that um, King George III and his wife, Queen Charlotte, are buried there. And interestingly enough, King George III is our next subject for blind history, which mm. um, we launched 
the, the fifth season of last week, and he'll be episode two. So you can hear all about King George III. He's the king who went mad and, um, and who also had hundreds of children. Not hundreds, but he had a lot of children. And uh, two of his sons, King George IV and William IV, are buried there as well. But they're, they're, their coffins are just there. They're not in the ground. So they're just Gareth, would you would you want to visit it again, or would that be revolting? Ah, <laughs> uh, sorry, that took a moment. Very good. Very good. But <laughs> um, it's just it's so weird. Like you, you know, you can. I actually saw like King George the Third's coffin. It's been there for two hundred years, just sitting there on the shelf. So how how do they prevent you know odors and things from decomposition? That's a very good question. I'll tell you how. Um, so Prince Philip was buried in a in an oak coffin, a, co a coffin of English oak, but it's lined with lead on the inside. It's also why it's so heavy. Um, so it's lined in a thin uh, layer of lead on the inside, and it's it's actually uh, sealed. the The lead lining is sealed. They've buried royals like this for couple of hundred years now and they actually seal the lid so everything is contained in the coffin no matter what happens to the body in decomposition or anything else so it, it it's it's sealed off it can't hmm. be open and um usually they they used to embalm um you know like almost mummify uh dead people dead royals in those days but um they've they've done some excavations of royal tombs from you know the 13 and 1400s and they found them very well preserved because of this lead lining on the coffin. So it's all kind of macabre, but it's really interesting to see. And I don't know how many people have been into St. George's Chapel's vault. I don't think they, they allow many people. And it would, certainly no cameras um, have ever been down there. And um, you, you may, may occasionally see an illustration from the Victorian era of what went on down there. But there, are, there, there was one picture of King Edward VII's coffin when it was waiting down there um, for his memorial to be built. Really, really interesting stuff. I mean, this is we're talking about like deep kind of royal uh, arcane knowledge of you know stuff that most people probably don't care about. So I hope that's not boring, but I thought it might interest some people. Incredibly mm -hmm. interesting. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I like the well, idea bit, of just you're a bit freaked out, yeah. Sitting there, yeah. Mm. Okay. But talking about um, the Queen's state of health uh, a little earlier, perhaps it's because, you know, the, the British royals aren't as dramatic or into show, like, for example, the White House is. But the, with the White House and the sitting US president, you, you often hear about just the preparation and, and, and the teams that are around a president. You know, you, we know that there's almost a makeshift, not even a makeshift, a full-fledged hospital or at least a doctor's room in the White House and how you know mm. the, the health of the president is prioritized so much. You don't really hear much about that with the royals, you know, but I'm sure they're you know very that, well taken care of. You know that when Prince Charles travels, they have uh, blood travel with him. <gasps> there's, there's actually, mm. yeah, a couple of bags mm. of blood that go with him in case he needs a blood transfusion of some kind, Extra no matter where fabulous. he goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, you're totally taking notes, firstly from the funeral and now from these comments. You've, just you've written down, you've, you've faced the screen, but you've written down lead lined coffin. <laughs> Can I put that in my rider when I MC an event now? <laughs> From now on, if you want to book me to MC your corporate <laughs> end of year function, I need two pints of my blood <laughs> just in case something happens. I need a yeah. lead lined coffin just in case I die on stage. Ah, fabulous. No, this is the, the so look, I mean, there's all these weird things that I suppose just because these, these people have been. Uh, thought of as more important than the rest of us, that they've this, you know they've developed these uh, these ceremonies and these very strange requirements and 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 special protections and special uh, needs 
that they that they've built into the monarchy. I don't know how exactly it works, but you you can tell it's you know it's it hasn't just happened overnight. And there's constant improvement happening all the time. There are things that they're doing that they've never done before. Uh, Philip was a big part of that. I mean, he modernized the monarchy incredibly. Um, you know, brought TV cameras into the coronation, for example. And let me tell you something. If you think a royal funeral is spectacular, in your lifetime and in mine, we will see maybe one or two coronations. And those are absolutely dazzling. There is probably no other ceremony on earth that can even come close to it. Nothing you've ever seen can prepare you for what you will see when Charles is crowned and later William is crowned. And we may just see both of them because, you know, Charles, is for, for obvious reasons, going to have a much shorter reign than his mother did. It's quite something. So if you want to, if you like, all the, if you like the pageantry and you like all of that, um, that ceremony, my God, you're in for like, you're in for something mm. really special. No. Is there a point where Prince Charles could just not um, accept the role? No. Oh, okay. Never well, he can, ab- I mean, he, can, he could abdicate like uh, Edward VIII, the Duke of Windsor did. But I don't think he's going to do that. I think he's been preparing his whole life for this. Yes, and, uh, he really there's has. No, there's no chance that he's uh, going to abscond from his duties. Plus, it would, it, that would really put the monarchy in huge disarray. And, and also, you know, all these people who say, well, the queen can just pass it on to William. She can't. That she, even she is not allowed to do that. It has to go through the normal line of primogeniture, which means that Charles becomes King Charles. He may choose the name George, for all we know. Um, it would be strange because he's been called Charles his whole life. But you choose your, your regnant name. And um, he'll probably be King Charles III, if that happens. Um... William would be William in the in front of me. Yeah. You have what in front of you? Oh, the ruler. Yeah. There we go. The rulers no. of England. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> has his rulers of England ruler. You yes, bought that, the you? last. You bought that at Westminster yeah. Abbey, or did I give it to you? I can't even remember. Yeah, bought it there. Mm. And so the last Charles, there was Charles II in 1660. Right. Sure. Oh, God. All right. Very good. That's enough of that royal nonsense. Uh, we've got lots of other things to talk about this morning, including collections, which we'll get to in a short while. Um, if you want to get hold of us, if you want to send us a message, uh, 079-748-2090, and uh, we can talk about what's been going on. Wow. Bitcoin went from like $63,000 a Bitcoin last week dropped down to $56,000 this week. So the Bitcoin roller coaster continues. Um, and I only mention that because Andre says, I wonder if Prince Philip had Bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, some some good shit there. I had uh, supper last night with uh, with my family. It was the first time that it's been, because my, my brother's wife and, and his kids are, are with her dad at the moment. And uh, my sister's boyfriend was busy. So it was, it was for the first time, just us five again, my mom, dad, brother, sister, and I. It was weird. We had dinner last night and we looked around and it was like, this is the first time it's just been the five of us since probably we were all at school. Wow. wow. No, it was nice though. I mean, we're lucky we were all still around, right? Um, yeah, so that's the thing. <laughs> it was really cool. Yeah, just um, and, and lovely. My, my dad decided to do a roast, which he's actually pretty good at. You know, again, I... I Cooking is not my strong point at all. I, you know I can cook mm-hmm. absolutely nothing. I'm useless in the kitchen. We've talked about this a million times. And they gave me a, a slow cooker for Christmas last year, which was very, mm-hmm. really, I mean, like that was optimistic on their part. So I've, I've got the slow cooker, and my mom was saying to me last night, oh, she's got the slow cooker, but it doesn't work properly. So I said, to her, well, why don't you just take the one take back? back your you gift. <laughs> no, take back the one that you gave me for Christmas. But she said, oh, but aren't you going to use it? And I, I looked at her and I said, what is, I mean, do you know anything about me? <laughs> really? Just, I mean, I love it and a very nice gift and everything, but it's been sitting on my shelf since Christmas and I'm never going to use it. It's almost, it's almost May and I, I, haven't, I haven't even turned it on to see how it works. So I think I'm just going to give it back. Yeah, best you do. You, you can't have old pressure cookers or faulty pressure cookers in the house. If if you watch this is us, then we know that you can't. Oh, exactly. I mean, I, 
I can't. It's not a pressure cooker. It's a slow cooker. So it's like one of those things that you would make a stew in, I suppose. Well, yeah, it's right. the same thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it? You see how little I know? Yeah, what no. the hell? Are you, are you still watching This Is Us? Yes. I've just watched the, the first series of the first epi episode of the new season. Sure. That dreadful series now. <laughs> now, after I've been through it, I think it's dreadful. Why do you think it's you dreadful? Really? What's wrong it's, with it? It's sad. It's very it's sad, sad, yeah. Very hard. There was just never an episode that one can watch and you get up and go, oh, that was great. You're always just thinking, oh, life is just horrible. The end is nigh. Listen to this. Yeah. Uh, Snai, yeah. who's, who's very active this morning. Snai says, I re recently moved into a newly built estate. I reported a snag last month and the construction manager came to attend to it. He advised me never to switch my geezer off because it uses up a lot of electricity when it's switched back on to heat the water. Well, um, I, I don't know about the specifics of that, Snai, but I do think that our advice last week from Leanne was very helpful. I've actually heard from two people already in person, not even just on email, two people in person who listen to our show on Friday and um, are only filling their kettle a little bit now when they boil it, Leanne. So you mm. really, you, you're like the Isabel Jones um, of this generation. <laughs> all of your tips. Well, well, in that case, I have another tip and that's with turning your geezer off. Okay. Um, yes, I agree with you on that, Snaya, but the one time that it is important to turn off your geezer is if you have a water cut that lasts for hours and hours or days oh, yeah. because you could burn out the element. So keep that in mind. If there is one time to turn it off, it's then. See? Leanne is full of useful tips and uh, she'll continue to do this for us on a weekly basis. It's very good. <laughs> this is why people love having you on, Leanne. Um, Annette says she agrees with Sia about that This Is Us show. It's awful. And Carl says... Um, that This Is Us is becoming like Grey's Anatomy. It should have ended after season two. Too much greed. I suppose that's what they... The, the greed is that they keep making the show because it's obviously making them money. Yeah. No, I mean, it could, Look, it could be a bit of a stretch right now, but um, I don't know. Just I just, yeah, I enjoy it. It's, it it Tracy, is. It's beautiful. Tracy, it's shot well, but yeah, just sorry, too uh, sad. Tracy wants to correct you, Leanne. A pressure cooker is not the same as a slow cooker. Huh. Oh. Yes, you don't oh. know everything, all right? I thought maybe a slow cooker used pressure. Hmm, okay. Different thing, clearly. All right, and Amy's, saying what, Amy's saying what everyone's thinking. I need to re-watch the stream to get all the good tips. Yes, you do. <laughs> absolutely right. Pause and take okay. notes. Yeah, absolutely. Pay attention, for God's sake. Um, I'm very excited about the, uh, the new season of Blind History. We've received so many very cool comments from people about the first episode, which was Al Capone, featured last week. But um, while all of that cool stuff is going on, I found this on social media today, and I thought maybe we should advertise it and see if anyone's interested in buying it. Are you ready? Look at this. Oh, yeah. What do you th yeah, I thought this might be something that you're interested in. Hang on a second. Let me just do this quickly. Um, I need to sort something out here on my screen. Just give me oh, a second. Okay. I know it's, it's all very, it's very, it's all very, uh, you know, complicated for me. See, let me it's just try quite an operation. Ooh, yes, it's I, like flying a plane. How many buttons do you have? Have Ooh. a look at that. See that? Okay. Yes. Shall I describe them? Yeah, go on. Describe it quickly and read what it says. That's useful. And I just need you to remove that comment so I can see underneath. Yeah. Okay, oh. <laughs> okay. Pair so jeans. it's a pair, pair of jeans. jeans. No. Um, they're 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 quite well worn, um, oh. and they're, they're just showing the back end of them. Mm -hmm. And it, there's a, a brown smear um, mm. in in the crack, and it's called lightly shut pants. Thirty eight yes. out of 30, 38 and the thirty four, uh, for forty dollars. But so listen. I think those are it, spheres, aren't they? They could hey, be, but hey, the, the hey, thing hey. is, whoever wore these pants wore them very <laughs> low because the lightly shat area is quite high up. It's between the top of the top pockets. <laughs> Ew. Horrible. <laughs> Terrible Get stuff. Get my name go. out of your mouth. 
That's, <laughs> sorry, Tia, but people are always thinking about that. We're never going to let it go. Sorry, whether you like it or not. You know, All I right. was I I bumped into someone who listens to the show over the weekend, and I was walking with a gentleman caller. So as oh. soon as I, I'm so sorry, it didn't even get your name. You probably thought I might have been rude to you, but I thought knowing our listeners, they'll be like, hey, see, well, you know what you <laughs> did? And I thought, this is not what I need when I walked with a gentleman caller. So I thought, hey, hey, gotta go. I'm just getting out of there, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, no. Uh, I'm very excited let's... about this. Uh, we're t- we're going to do something new this morning. It's called Collectomania. And many of us suffer from this. I don't think suffer is the right word. Uh, although for people who don't collect, they think it's, it's bizarre when you do. And there are some people who just don't collect anything, right? Uh, some people who just aren't that interested in collections. I mean, I found one or two of them when we were doing research around this. Very rare people, those. But um, I'm, I'm a mad collector of all kinds of things. And if you've mm. ever watched... Or, or, or listen to the show, you'll know. I, I collect books, I collect coins, I collect swords, I collect pictures, I collect chemicals. Chemi- I've, I've got a periodic table with all the elements uh, on the periodic table. So I'm I'm actually a maniac when it comes to this stuff. So I wouldn't blame anyone for for being a little bit put off by me doing that. But I do think I'm in the the majority here because I think everybody has some interest in something, and. It is, to me, the most worthwhile way to spend my time and money. And I'm, I'm, it just gives me such satisfaction. And I think this morning, we're going to talk about, uh, in our first episode of Collectomania, uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the work that, that Rael and, De- and, and Alan Demby do, because they, Alan started the SA Gold Coin Exchange, which I've actually I've, I've bought from you guys before at your Scoin shop. And we're going to find out all about their love of collecting. So, first of all, welcome, Alan, and welcome, Rael. Nice to see you, you both. Very good to Thank see you. Hi, Gareth. On the show. Yeah, how thanks are you? For, thanks for having us. Yeah, all good, all good. Thank you. You. Good, Alan. So, listen, I've, I've got a couple of questions right up front. I just want you to tell us the story of how you started the South African Gold Coin Exchange, because obviously gold is something people have collected for millennia, and we've discussed gold as a as a store of value on the show many, many times, but it's, it's more than that. I mean, we all know that, that gold has an inherent value and a preciousness, but you started this business. I mean, there are only certain ways you can actually own gold in South Africa, right? Well, you can actually own any collectible coin or medallion in South Africa. You weren't able to own cast bars because it's all part of the whole IDB dealing in uncut, unwrought diamonds, unwrought gold. So right. even to this day, you can only have certain types of bars. But in the main in South Africa, coins is the easiest way. And of course, Krugerrands, which the guys, uh, the Chamber of uh, Mines created in 1967, has been the success story of South Africa. Um, it was rated top, one of the top 300 brands in the world. And to date, probably 70, 80 million coins have been sold. And probably the most interesting thing is that uh, the Kruger Rand has spawned a whole host of other, I wouldn't say imitators, but from other countries around the world that today there are probably 300, 400 million one ounce, half quarter, tenth. In other words, fractional Kruger Rands. Um, right. in circulation today from America, Canada, England, um, let's go around the, the world, uh, China, Austria, um, Australia, and so on. So it's a huge uh, market, and it's just an easy way to own a coin. It's a one-ounce gold coin whose price is quoted in the stock exchanges on the markets around the world, literally from Monday morning in Hong Kong, all the way through to Hong Kong uh, on Saturday lunchtime. So for a good five and a half days a week, there's nonstop trade. It's a very huge market. um, And that has helped uh, popularize, if you will, coins, to the point that it has enhanced 
coin collecting uh, and taking it to a new level. Numismatics, right? That's what you call it. So I'm, I'm something of a numismatist, and um, I've actually bought, uh, I bought some, some coins from you guys before because I, I, you know, I find that kind of thing really interesting. I've got an old coin collection that my great-grandfather started, and uh, there are some really interesting coins in there. But tell me about the SA Gold Coin Exchange because that was really your baby, and, and you were ahead of your time in, in starting that up. And all the coin shops around the country are also your brainchild, are they not? Um, well, I was I was the son of the SA Gold Coin Exchange, not uh -huh. not in the not in the same way that that Rail is the son of Scoin, but um, <laughs> the Gold Coin Exchange was started in 1972, and I was conscripted to the army in 1977, and uh, I'd been to university to just to study a VCOM, and I was called up to the army for uh, a year initially, but they extended my invitation by 12 months, so I got stuck in the army for two years. And while I was in the army, I was always looking to make a few bob because I didn't have any money. Uh, sure. a, tr a troop in those days, uh, a private uh, to, to everybody else, was earning about three rand twenty-five a day. So it wasn't really much uh, to buy a McDonald's. Well, thankfully no. that thankfully they didn't have McDonald's in South Africa then. <laughs> And uh, I was in the army and uh, I was in uh, chief pay with a couple of guys and auditors. And uh, one day my colleague said to me, should we start dealing in Kruger Rands? And I said, well, yeah. what's a Kruger Rand? I've never ever seen one in my life. And he said, no, wow. there's this coin you can get from the bank and uh, you can buy and sell. And I said, well, all right, we'll give it a chance. I've always been uh, quite entrepreneurial. I was selling paintings door to door in Pretoria in Sunnyside. I had already had a range to show at the Pretoria um, uh, trade show, agricultural show. So, you know, I needed some money and, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, didn't have uh, extra and uh, I, that's what I had to do. And I was hustling in those days and um, yeah. We put an advert in the Pretoria News and um, somebody answered and said he had a couple of coins to sell. So mm -hmm. my partner, so to speak, was the money man. He was the yeah. accountant and I was the front man. You know, I was I was the lead singer who couldn't <laughs> sing. I was the lead singer who couldn't sing. Right. And so um, this guy said he had six coins to sell and it was 500 rand each. We needed 3,000 Rand. I had 1,500 Rand from my days of wheeling and dealing, part of which was uh, I was a manager of my friend's band in those days called Flash Harry. Wow, but you've really this, you've done a lot of interesting stuff. My God. Yeah, yeah. So that was like quite an interesting era in my life. So anyway, we put the 3,000 Rand together. My yeah. friend's job was to go to the bank and get a bank guaranteed check. Mm -hmm. um, that alone is uh, a collectible because nobody even uses bank checks anymore. And sure. that is part, uh, collecting checks is actually part of numismatics, actually, strangely enough. Really? J just as an aside, uh, and collecting bank notes, a American, I think it was a thousand dollar bill called a watermelon, because it's got yes. a lot of these funny green things in them uh, is in the 100 the, so the zeros look like watermelons sold yeah. for a million dollars a couple of years wow. ago i i just want to i want to stop you for a second there because i want to bring rail in here um rail i mean we've spoken about the scoin shops very briefly but obviously you know you must have seen this and thought how do we how do we make this even easier for people to get involved in and um you know, having been to these shops, it's amazing what you can get now. You, you guys sell silver Krugerrands. You sell all kinds of precious metals. Tell me about the, the idea behind that and, and how that came about. So I'll, I'll speed up uh, the, the really good story of my father's is that he wanted gold to be accessible. He wanted people to uh, be able to collect and you would walk into a shop or an environment that actually feels welcoming because gold coins and 
any type of gold, it actually seems to be quite overwhelming. So in 1999, uh, I was still just a little boy and my father was at work and he started the coin shops and he wanted you to walk into the shop and learn about coins, all types from all over the world. So in his uh, long career of going and meeting with mints from around the world and doing these uh, wonderful deals, he was able to bring in a product into South Africa uh, that celebrates milestones and events and historical uh, stories from these mints, the British Royal Mint, the, the, the Mint of Paris, and that's sort of what we try to do is make it accessible in the shops today. And every day we try to make it more accessible by uh, so finding coins, yeah. It's a, it's a magic thing because uh, I suppose for, for people who are collectors, and we were talking about that at the start of this, um, seeing any place where you can get more collections, where you can get more to add to your collection is always the most exciting thing for people like me who are obsessed with this stuff. So do you collect anything, Rail? I do. I, I like a good uh, – it used to be sneakers and cheaper things, but I've always had a, a bit of an uh, interest in watches. Uh, my father he would bring me back from these coin shows, like some cool yeah. fake watches, but but then I don't want any fake ones anymore. I like to look for it. And, and you said something important now, Gareth, is it's all about the chase, really. It's about yeah. finding the coin or finding the watch or the chemical or whatever you're looking for really sure. once you have it you, you want to find the next thing um mm. it's a, it's actually the whole all-encompassing idea of collecting that you're passionate about and that's what we try to do the watches is a hobby it's something you can read up about or learn about and i'm sure as we learn more about the collector mania uh, program, you're going to see loads of amazing people. The people at the scoin shop on the ground have been uh, sending us their collections. I have guys yes. collecting uh, spiders, uh, baby dolls, uh, really weird, like a uh, laugh like baby dolls. I have um, uh, guns and um, uh, uh, Zippo lighters. <laughs> so the guys have everything. And every one of you, every one of us really inherently likes to collect. Well, I mean, this is this is what I want people to know. Today, we, we, we do want to explain to people um, where you you and your dad, um, and Alan, I'm going to ask you in a second what you collect, but I wanted to, to let people know what you guys think of collecting because I think many of us can relate to that. And then we'll we'll get on to what, uh, what other people do. And, you know, if you've got a particularly weird collection of things, then you must please send us an email. I'd love to add you to the show so we can talk about your collections too. So, Alan... Um, I know Sia and Leanne collect some things too. We'll come to them in a second. But what do you collect besides, obviously, coins? Um, actually, I'm not really a coin collector. It never really uh, attracted me. Um, I came onto the scene more out of a, a business approach. And sure. I always think that my I don't know what you want to call it, uh, success in democratizing gold was precisely because I didn't know too much about it. You know, um, you can always get bogged down in the figures, but I've always collected um, things and unusual things when I've gone to the coin shows. But um, I've brought one or two things. If we can show your your your, of course. yeah, let's your, have a your, look. So what is that? Um, so in my travels, um, I came across this coin. It was made yeah. in the um, I think it's. Uh, part of the islands near Finland, and it's called A-L-A-N-D, a a a A-Land, but yeah. this is better, I've taken the plastic off, but A-Land is Alan D. So when I saw this, oh, this is incredible. Oh. They've actually named uh, a coin no, after me. <laughs> or, 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 or maybe they've maybe they've named an island after me. So this is like a peculiar <laughs> thing that I picked up, which I thought was like quite strange. Um, yeah. In my, um, I couldn't find it, but in my travels at the coin shows, I actually found a pair of cufflinks in American coin show that were worn by um, one of the dignitaries at the uh, at the opening dinner of the of the president of America. So it's got the American uh, 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 coat of arms on. So that was like quite strange and weird. And then um, looking around, and this is really the precursor of this whole scoring idea, was um, in about the early 
I should get out of the way. In, no, in, no, that's in, perfect. Out of the way. Bring it slightly uh, the other we, way. There we are. That's there right. we are. What okay. Wow. So in the early 1980s, 1990s, mid-90s, yeah. I was looking to try and create a coin that had a universal um, appeal to it. Universal, yeah. universal in the sense that it would be easy to make and colorful and fun. So Beautiful. you might recall about 20 odd years ago, uh, they had cow parade. So cow yeah, parade. Well, we had all, those, all those painted cows all over the place, right? Right. So that started in Zurich in the early 1990s. Uh, business was bad in the city centers. And they tried to jazz it up. And they invited a whole bunch of artists to paint these cows made of fiberglass. And everybody yeah. came up with a new idea. And it started to take traction it then uh, caught off in south africa and after the auction um sorry after the after the show they auctioned it off we bought a few uh, we bought mm -hmm. um blow Bulla, we bought mm -hmm. goli and a few other um cows with uh, uh, um uh, with, with funny names and it got me thinking and we started to put them into our scoring shops then I went overseas. We found out the uh, the people who own the um, the intellectual property for this. And to cut a long story short, we bought the rights to cow parade around the world. Amazing. And there prob probably been about ten thousand cows that so have been made to date. And so we came up or came up with the idea of scoin. That was the first idea. Scoin. And the yeah. idea was a coloured. A colorful coin that would be quick and easy to make. Um, the reverse would have the queen on, um, as in the from the Perth Mint. And here are two coins that I thought I should bring. The one is New Donna. So everything oh, that's had brilliant. So everything <laughs> had a sort of a. <laughs> so that was New Donna. Yeah. And this was no um, P. Calso. Oh, that's oh, cool. right. But that's so that, amazing. So the idea it, was to was to democratize gold by having colorful, collectible gold coins, and that's how we invented the name Scoin. And, and then after and be, the Scoin shops, there would obviously be a limited um, series of those. So you know, sure. those are probably those are probably all sold, and you can't get them anymore. And if you do, then you're going to have to pay a pretty price more than you did when you made them, right? Yes, exactly. So. Um, um, we, we, the mintage was a hundred of each and we we made several hundred over the years and people bought them uh, for fun, for limited edition, for the underlying gold price. And it was just an interesting, unusual, fun, funky way to buy gold. So that was my sort of I'm, I'm interested. Con I mean, contribution. This is precisely what uh, I think makes you guys so interesting and, and why I'm so excited to start this discussion. And, and by the way, we'll be talking to people who collect unbelievably weird things in the next couple of episodes. But while we're on coins, how, how exactly does SCOIN or the South African Gold Coin Exchange, how do you guys continue? Is it with things like this to innovate? Um, like you've just shown us those, those ones with the cows on them. I mean, this is a way, Ryle, and you could perhaps answer this. This is a way to take coins into the into the 21st century right of course i mean the mints from around the world just keep growing and changing and it used to be about historical boring events but uh, now the british royal mint came out with a series of 007 coins uh oh. celebrating last year's movie no time to die uh but it, yeah. there was no time to launch it, it never actually <laughs> uh, came out the, the thing about, oh, there you go. The thing about this coin is maybe it'll be more special and more collectible because of the fact that the the, the event didn't happen. Um, the, the idea of the, the Paris Mint, uh, they come out with the most incredibly designed products. There's one gold coin in the shape of an egg. It looks like a, a fried egg. I think you've got a picture of it. It's, it's incredible. Um, yeah. We're innovating. Oh, wow. We're innovating ourselves 
to make it more uh, accessible for you. You can buy online, you can buy with cryptocurrencies, you can, we can store the gold for you. Um, the idea that the mints from around the world keep uh, continuing to innovate and uh, share with these remarkable stories is what we'll show you in, in weeks to come as I well. I mean, so you guys sell these rock legends one, which has got David Bowie, Queen, Elton John, um, and then yeah. I saw the 007 ones too, which are incredible. I mean, so you you can actually you can get these at the coin shops. So we're exclusive distributors of these coins from the world's most prestigious mints. We bring in the best coins that we know our clients want. Um, mm. Some of them are expensive, but some of them can be reasonable, and it could be yeah. a starting point for you to begin collecting. And uh, we'll continue to bring in these beautiful coins, and the mints will continue to be cool and relevant and, and modern. And coins could be seen as quite like a boring old, Old man old-fashioned thing but my objective taking over uh, is to do that is to make it fun and exciting for more people you know uh, one of the things one of the things that makes this so special is if you do collect these coins these things could be around for thousands of years not just hundreds because they're still digging up you know these coin hoards from ancient rome and ancient egypt where you know, people used coins for, that was actual money that they trade with and because gold is such a an inert metal it just lasts forever i mean you know that you could you could find something that's been buried for a thousand years and and if it's made of gold it it doesn't rust it doesn't decay it's there forever i think that if you're going to collect you may as well start with something that you know is going to last and that's that's really special exactly. so i want to ask yeah i want to ask sia and uh, leanne quickly what do you guys collect we'll start with you leanne what do you, what do you collect um, I started collecting stamps from a very young age, um, I'd say primary school. And when my great when my great grandmother died, she had heard the fact that um, I collected stamps, and two generations before her collected as well. So mm -hmm. I inherited her stamp collection and um, continued to build on it ever since. I mean, whether it holds any value or not is, um, you know, that remains to be seen. But uh, it, yeah, it was in, it was really an exciting part of my life to dedicate time over the weekends, um, and I even remember the feeling of excitement of putting together album upon album of of these stamps. Um, I've since handed them to another family member who's who just has a, an amazing interest in looking at them. So mm -hmm. she holds on to them. So you're, a, but you're, a, you're a philatelist. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, stopped, oh. I stopped collecting a long time ago, um, but that was, you know, the biggest collection that I, that I have. It's amazing. Sia, you, you um, have the word philatelist and numismatist. We've learned those two this morning. What Very you fancy. You know, I, I, I thought of, I was, you know, I used to think I didn't collect, but up until you realize, you know, whatever you put a lot of attention to and a lot of quirky things that you put together technically do make you a bit of a collector. So I'm thinking about the fact that as a family, we collect a lot of, you know, a series or sets of books. So mm -hmm. we have at least about like two or three variations of encyclopedias just as a whole oh, yeah. set someone finds something quirky we collect that um we have sets of different atlases as well so we still have that in our study at home and then personally well mine still are very <laughs> i'll say very juvenile collections but i went through a big big michael jackson phase especially when yeah. he died so i have a whole lot of those collections i have all of my oprah collections as well and well, I, I want to interrupt you because um, Alan and Rael and everybody else who's listening, you, you might not know this about Sia, but if, if you've listened to the show regularly, you would. Like there was a chance where Sia went on eBay and he could have bought, oh, one, of the, he could have bought one, of the, one of the chairs that the audience sat in at the Oprah Winfrey show. And it was, it was going for like a pretty good price. And Sia is such an Oprah fan that he really wanted to buy it. And he thought, ah, nah, I'm not going to get it. And now I he should have. That. I kicked myself in the foot because of that. And then the last random thing that I've realized now in hindsight, I, I do collect as well is, you know, it, with all of my travels, I, I like souvenirs that I can use. 
So I started ages ago asking the airline and to carry, to get those blankets that they have in the, in the airline. So I now have a set of those and it tells a story yeah. if you use a little blanket and, or throw when you remember. Are allowed to take those out? <laughs> well, that's, that is why we've had many a conversation and sweet talking the air, the cabin yes, crew. I think Rail's <laughs> implying that you might have actually stolen those. Yeah, I, am not, I am not implicating myself. It is through yeah. asking. Okay. Well, I mean, there are lots of comments here. I mean, Snae says, uh, who's been very busy this morning, I collect souvenirs from all the countries I've been to. I mean, a lot of people like to do that because then you get home and you've got something to remind you of your trips. Uh, people are big into silver at the moment. Just quickly, before we let you guys go, um, the silver price has actually gone up recently, but silver is a nice thing to collect too because it has utility as well as just being a store of value. Um, and, and silver is you know, one of the precious metals that you sell. So how does silver compare to gold in terms of sales? Well, I think uh, they say silver is the poor man's gold, but um, silver has been as is as old as the hills probably the first coins were actually made of silver and yeah. strangely enough of the top 10 most valuable coins in the world half a dozen of them are actually silver coins um a nickel wow. uh, an american nickel recently sold for about 10 million dollars and yeah. the first silver dollar sold for roughly that as well so um i think that silver as you say was more um often used in trade, people had more access to silver than ever before. And as you say, people just use it for money, use it for trade. And along the way, they just accumulated these coins and um, it just has a certain appeal, particularly in Europe. Um, Europeans don't have the same amount of, say, spare cash, if you will, as perhaps the Yanks, and they just like silver coins. You know, silver has yeah. has been around for a long, long time. So they tend to like silver coins. Having said yeah. that, the Americans are huge collectors of silver coins. I, I, I would say that the Europeans and the, the Americans are the biggest collectors of silver. You know, from an investment pricing point of view, silver used to be $5 an ounce. Uh, it ramped up to $50 an ounce in the early 80s when um, the two Hunt brothers who were oil billionaires tried to um, corner the market. And uh, shortly thereafter, the market collapsed and it went to a few dollars an ounce. So silver has been out of favor for a long, long time, but uh, it's recently pushed up to about $25, $30 dollars an ounce. So it is yeah. more affordable and um, people like the idea. I think what has changed is that it, it, it sounds rather sort of silly, but the mints have put together a box, if you will, of 500 silver coins. Oh yeah. And it's just easy and you know, it's very heavy metal. And so uh, the specific gravity is very high. So this is something for you, uh, Gareth. The specific yep. gravity is very high. And so uh, it's easy to buy a 500 coin box of coins. So you're finding a yep. lot of sort of investors, if you will, coming into the market. It's just, just easy to buy this and put it in your safe or in your... Um, well, I'll show, you, I'll show you what I bought from you guys not so long ago. Here's a silver Krugerrand. Which I got from well, the shop. Yeah, this is a, a, from, from which year is that? Uh, 2017. Yes. Yeah, so in 2017, the South African Mint brought out the 50th anniversary of the first Kruger Rand. Right. And the coins all have got mint marks on it. So if you see oh. on the back, there's like a little hologram. That's there's right. The front and there's the back. And I put oh, it wow. back in the plastic now. But there's there's Paul Kruger. And it says Correct. South African. It's got the date here, and it says 2017. Right. So, um, wow. it and don't take it out of the plastic again. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep it careful. <laughs> yeah, because silver, of course, tarnishes. It's not as resilient as gold is, right? Yes. yes. But sometimes when it tarnishes, it creates a huge, like, rainbow feel, and it gives a lot yeah. of eye appeal. But that takes yeah. 
that that takes about a hundred years. So <laughs> the South African mint brought out the 50th anniversary of the Krugerrand, the most popular and best-selling coin in the world. And those mm. coins had those holograms on them. They were minted in uncirculated, you know, that you could put in your pocket, yeah. but also as proof collectibles, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium from one ounce right down to one fiftieth ounce. So mm -hmm. it, it it created new collectors. So we, we, when when we spoke about what mints do, mints generally are making new product in, um, for instance, like um, uh, 3D coins, uh, coins with musical uh, um, uh, notes in them, hologram, mm -hmm. color coins, That's uh, phenomenal. strange coins, Batman coins. But what we do is we creating new distribution channels and new ways to open up the way you can buy it. So Guys, instance, I, I, could, I, could, I could talk to you about this all day, but we're, we're already out of time. And I'm, I'm excited that we've started this, but this is by no means the end. So Alan and, and Rael, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there for this morning. But this is, this is a great place to start. And we will be collector maniaing for the next couple of weeks. And uh, you can find out more about any of the stuff we discussed this morning by going to the page on cliffcentral.com. And we want to hear about your collections. It, it might be stuff like CS says that's juvenile. It might be stuff that's really valuable. I, um, I love that we're starting with coins because it's something I care about. And we will check in with, uh, with Alan and Ryle every now and then. But we mostly want to hear from you about what you're doing. And thank you both for being on the show this morning. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Let's, Great to see you guys. Thank collecting. you. Yeah, well, let's let's uh, let's find out what everyone's collecting. Thank you, Ryle and uh, Alan, and uh, they are the South African Gold Coin Exchange. We'll tell you more about that in the forthcoming weeks. How cool is that, huh? I like my little silver coin. Gareth, yeah, you'll need to break down um, eventually what all your collections are. We'd love to know. Like, yeah, I'll leave mine. But uh, it, I come from a family of collectors. I mean, I'll tell you what my sister collects um, in, in a forthcoming episode, and it's going to surprise you. And my brother, yeah. even more weird. Um, so we all have different things. I think we're all collector maniacs. All right, everybody, that's all we got time for this morning. But thank you for being part of the show. Thank you for joining us this Monday, and I hope you have an awesome week. We will keep you company tomorrow from 6 a.m., bright and early. Have a good week.